So you were saying we have it's um, it's Native American History Month. Yeah. Yes, we, it's native. It, what it, it's American um, Indian Heritage Month. I'm sorry. American Indian Heritage Month. Yeah, American Indian Heritage Month. Today. But then I was seeing another trend. Which it's just the start of a month of. Is it, is it Gay Week? No, week, that was week la- month. That was last month. It was uh, LGBTQ Awareness Month. This one is. Uh, oh, it's transgen. <sighs> It's Transgender Awareness Month? Yes, yeah. This one it was LGBTQ Appreciation Month. So it's, okay, hold on a second. I want to make sure. So it's American Indian Heritage Month. Yes. Which I'm just, I don't even know. We were still, are we still saying Indian? Is it Indian? American Indian Heritage, and then Transgender Awareness Month. Month. Yes. Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, so I just want to make sure I get this right, folks, because we make all the references available. Uh, but in honor of your guess is as good as mine, uh, seems appropriate. Let's, let's run, a, let's run, uh, smells like two spirit. Yeah. Remember, none of this is possible without you. Join the fight and sign up for Mug Club today at louderwithcrider.com slash mug club for $89 annually. Join the fight at louderwithcrider.com slash mug club today.
All right, okay, I got that out of the way. Um, <clears throat> Gerald is uh, he's in Florida. He's in uh, Mar-a-Lago right Good. now, so we have a little bit of a different, a little bit of a different roundup. Uh, by the way, That's was right. it? Yeah, hope hope uh, hope Pelosi's been using roundup for a while. <laughs> <laughs> That's how Nick DiPaolo starts his show. Yeah. How many of uh, how many of you hope uh, Nancy Pelosi has been using Roundup in her garden for the last forty years? <laughs> Roaring applause. <laughs> <laughs> no, sometimes he walks half the room. So uh, we have a lot to get to today. Elon Musk was on uh, Joe Rogan's show in the Halloween special to talk about why he bought X and what he saw there. So that's pretty important. Uh, some new updates on uh, former Vice President Joe Biden's eighty-two thousand emails. Hunt involves Hunter in Ukraine. Uh-oh. And then uh, we're going to get into a a couple of news stories. Did the IDF really bomb a refugee camp? Uh, Because Israel now has started a a land invasion of Gaza, which is why we'll actually have a military expert on the show, uh, John Spencer, later on. uh, We're uh, actually replacing Gerald today, uh, Josh Firestein. He's not in third chair. We're going to have a segment, Josh Knows War, where you'll be conducting the interview, Josh. Yes, yeah, sounds fun. And you're going to be in a Bricktown, a Bricktown Comedy Club in Oklahoma City? Yes, this Sunday I'm at Bricktown Comedy Club. Nice. November 5th. November 5th. Sorry, I didn't have, a, I forgot the date. I'm not good with dates. So here, look, before I move on, my question to you is there's a lot of misinformation, and it's not lost on me, on both sides regarding Israel and Palestine. Now, it doesn't change the fact that I want every single last member of Hamas um, to die horrible deaths, okay? But... I also understand that there are both sides here kind of reporting some some uh, updates or death counts that, that are really, at the very least, hard to verify. So genuine question to you, are there any publications, sources, outlets that you still trust to deliver accurate news? Comment below. Uh, I get it. It's hard in the age of this is the information war age. I mean, Alex Jones was right about a lot. And uh, we're going to dive right into it. But in third chair, you hear this, you know him, you love him. I descended from his loins. That is <laughs> Pops Crowder. How are you, sir? I'm great. That's such a great groove, though. If we could just play that every once in a while. Well, it's a song about impregnating it. women in yeah. clubs, so I don't know if you. Yeah. I don't know if he knows the lyrics. I don't know the words. Uh. And before any of that, it's uh, Josh. We were talking about this. It's Transgender Awareness Month. <laughs> don't, yeah. Is it just me? Don't you feel like that we've already had one? Yeah, and I'm also like aware. Uh, we're aware. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> like enough, I'm not like we can all tell. I don't think we've ever been more aware of anything. Like kids in the '60s yeah. weren't more aware to not play with blasting caps. Wa- <laughs> <laughs> Trans visibility. Everybody, Everybody wearing the Harry Potter seen. cloak. They want to be seen. Yes, yeah, we see you. Yeah, yeah, no, we see more than we'd like to. Yeah, exactly. Oh, actually, trans- somebody could do some research, but I think June is their month. <laughs> That's Pride. That's pride. That's a different That's thing. Just, yeah. Trans oh. visibility month, where now it's like oh, it's, okay. the roles are reversed. That's you the macro. To, now this is the. We all micro. have to show our gratitude. Yeah. yeah. No. You got to thank them for their transness. <laughs> you got to, yeah, thank them for their courage. <laughs> yes. Thank you. <laughs> for wearing that dress with those shoes? No. Oh. <laughs> I know. I took a risk. <laughs> now I know exactly how they feel on the West Bank. <laughs> I have to shave every day. Yes. Speaking of West Bank, your your your, your left is kind of banking. It's banking left a little bit with the fake process. Well, Joe Lewis didn't really appreciate Gay Williams' uh, costume yesterday. Oh no, he didn't. He did not see. He did not want to see him. He took a wide swath around him. <laughs> no, exactly. Very <laughs> odd. He is man. Which, by the way, he is man. It's. I mean, that's that's a great litmus test because um, he's colorblind. <laughs> <laughs> He, All he, he saw was the weird gay crap. He's just got a good judge of character. Yeah, he's just a good judge of character. <laughs> how many months? It's what we have four months now. How how many months for the wound to heal? Okay, uh, yeah. this is just. Uh, I think it's a four month recovery. Four months. <laughs> My preferred friction month. <laughs> Yes, hey, man. you saw the ride, you bought a ticket anyway. You know what? Just let people, if you're watching on YouTube, you should be watching on Rumble. So at some point today, if you haven't already, you're going to see this. Just head on over to Rumble, okay? What the hell's the difference? I just I just got hit with this tool man telling me he's like, oh no, you gotta go American Indian Heritage Month <laughs> and transgender, but whatever. Okay. Also, that's a, it's a shame that the they're you know minimizing the Native American Month or uh, Indian American. Yeah, they have to I split it. Exactly what it's called. You know, somebody's capitalizing. Aborigines. Oh yeah. Yes. Oh yeah. There's one Native <laughs> trans person that's just like First na- it's no First Nations. Hey, I'm called. One who split snatch. Hi, hi, hi. <laughs> hey, do you think do you think all the trans people are participating in No Shave November? Uh, oh, God. <laughs> I, I hope so. The Native Americans <laughs> certainly are because they're a hairless people. Yeah, designed perfectly by God. That's why. I'm... 
<laughs> they call me Big use. Penis Little Gash. Yes. <laughs> That's my native name. They call me Squats with Every. Yeah, big head, smaller body. Well, not smaller body, but you and your shorter. Fred Durst hat. <laughs> we put it backwards. Oh, he looks the same now, only just completely white. Just white. He looks like Santa Durst. <laughs> <laughs> <It's so good. laughs> what do you want for Christmas? Yeah. I want the nookie. Yeah. <laughs> Santa's gonna come down your chimney. He's gonna be rolling, rolling, rolling. <laughs> All right. It's just one of those days. Oh, why do you have that on the soundboard? <laughs> this is. Look at it. <laughs> oh my gosh! It's like it's like uh, someone tried to kill Chucky with bleach. <laughs> I had hits in the early 2000s. That's so good. <laughs> I'm gonna kill your sister. All right. <laughs> and Britney Spears is dead. So uh, here's a here's a Muslim woman. Before we move on, and we have uh, I'm sure Mr. Spencer will love this as his introduction, uh, John Spencer. And I'm looking forward to you actually doing the interview with him. You know, because you both. By the way, thank you for your service, Josh. Service. Yeah, I'm going to learn a lot from him. Pops Carter, you didn't thank him for his service. Oh, thank you for your service. Yeah, there you go. Thank you. <laughs> All right. <laughs> you get one free miss a thank you for your service, okay? That's what we call the grace, miss yes. thank you for your service. Okay. So here's a Muslim woman in a hijab um, showing TikTok how to live your uh, best life without showing your your face. This is why I didn't see my wife's face before marriage. Lego. When my dad approved of our marriage, he actually told my husband that he could see my face once before marriage, so why did you reject it? The reason is I knew you from working together for several years. I because he's gay and doesn't want to see your face. <laughs> with you, he and smelled I her. to be with you regardless of how you look. Not only did I do that, but I also got married to you without seeing your face. Muslim women cannot go to the gym in a face veil. Oh Imagine that smell. Actually, it's a struggle for me to eat outside <laughs> anywhere, and sometimes, like, I can always just pull up my veil like this, eat through here. But I actually found a better solution. We actually have a tent. There is a window, so I can just put it down when I'm eating. I have my bagel, turn around, and lift my bagel. <laughs> Covered, right? That's, That's a Jewish food. In Islam, women are supposed to cover certain parts of their bodies, even in front of other women. I'm supposed to cover from chest to knee in front of other women, but I prefer to be a little bit more modest. So while swimming in an all-female pool, I would wear long swim pants with swim shirt on top. That would mean my veil would come off, my hijab would come off, but my swim cap would stay on. What if the lifeguard is a man? Then I won't go swimming. When she's when she's adding the layers, it's like the Weezer pork and beans video. <laughs> <laughs> Every shirt you can imagine. That's a great pool. What's most offensive is the horrible form. First off, you do some compound movements. <laughs> also, they look pretty light. Those weights are light. Yeah, I know. And by, right away, it's like, why did I make my wife wear a veil? Oh, one guess. She ugly. <laughs> yeah, wear this yeah. veil. Put on this fake mustache. <laughs> <laughs> fake. And people will protect. It's their right. It's their choice. You know, this is the this is the intersect, right? Intersectionalism. It's just whoever they view as most oppressed, uh, most oppressed. So they support Islam, right? If they're, in a, if they're talking about Israel and Palestine, but in general, Islam versus Christianity. But then they have a pride flag, where of course the Muslims don't allow for any pride flag. You think they have Trans Awareness Month? But the issue is, it's just hey, they're oppressed. That's the worldview of the left: is whoever is most successful must be bad. Rich, bad. If you're a majority, okay, you're white, bad. If you're straight, bad. And so this is how they end up supporting ladies who, by the way, this is not their choice by law no. in Islamic countries. They don't have a choice, maybe in the United States, but women drown. When you look all throughout, all throughout the, the Arab world, the, the Middle East, they, they will drown. Wearing, it's like they're getting waterboarded. And I love how they always try to make it seem like it's really convenient. It's like eco-friendly stuff. It's really yeah. convenient. You don't have to flush your toilet. Just use some old oak ash and potpourri and have a dry toilet. It's like, what, what, okay, what? <laughs> I can't, sometimes I can't eat in public. I've, I've literally but never I heard I bring that. this tent everywhere I go. Yes, exactly. I just need the tent from Congo. <laughs> this is my snack tent. <laughs> 
<laughs> it's the same people that will support this because they're the most oppressed. The same people yeah. that if you if they saw a conservative Christian white man talking to his wife a certain way, they'll go, "Wow, what a piece of crap." Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And you're like, oh, "Okay." Like, yeah, what do you want your wife to wear? Prairie dresses? Well, you just supported yeah. that woman who was in a ninja yeah. outfit. Shut up. And, and she's loving it, though. <laughs> she's, just, that's empowering. she's just loving the status of the victim card. And, yeah. and none of it is to honor God. You notice that? Not, that didn't come out once. It was all, this is what I, this is my ritual. This is what I do. This is my prescription. Mm -hmm. To well, honor my for. father. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. This is how I, I go in a tent. <laughs> Arranged marriage. Do you bring a tent <laughs> everywhere? Right. Yeah, she just has it on her back. Like, she's just a hiker. Yeah. <laughs> And you know, underneath that scarf, it, it's just there's just a blower there. You can see it was hanging. On the nose. <laughs> just, just, it's, That's it's why he didn't want to see the face. He's like, I've yeah. seen enough already. This protrusion. <laughs> <laughs> she, he's married Daniel Stern. All right. <laughs> Don't shoot me in profile. Don't ever shoot me in profile. Uh, <laughs> it was the sound of an airstrike <laughs> flying into Gaza. All right. Let's move on to. Elon Musk uh, was on with Joe Rogan yesterday, uh, and this is always, you know, it's always uh, interesting to see Elon Musk. Um, some people say, oh, I think he's disingenuous because he's come to this later life. I don't. I think you're watching a man develop uh, in his later years, sort of becoming aware. And certainly, I bet you as he's gone into the Twitter files. Same thing with, honestly, uh, uh, President Donald Trump. Some people say former president. Some people say sitting president. I say sitting president. Okay. I think that he was somewhat fiscally conservative, and then all of his leftist friends turned on him. And then he realized that these people weren't his friends. And you saw him become more right-wing, more conservative. You comment below, uh, because I see a lot of criticism toward Elon Musk. But I think that he has some people in charge of Twitter sometimes who aren't necessarily following out his prescriptions, yes. as seen by many people here in the, at the Ladder with Crowder uh, crew who uh, have been suspended yes. mm -hmm. repeatedly. Yeah, well, Yakuza, you know, you may have committed crimes. So, uh, <laughs> and you can follow. I did read those. <laughs> Yes. yes. <laughs> I, was, I had to wash my eyes out. Yes. Yeah, well. <laughs> <laughs> well, the good thing is, he, you know, you won't have to take part in Trans Visibility Day. He was right, though. Yeah. But, but then back. tomorrow's Trans Auditory Month. So I don't know what that is. Yeah. Auditory Month? Yeah. You're going around checking them? Yeah. <laughs> it's just uh, weird noises. Yeah, it's just, <laughs> it's, just in the it's just the noise perpetually of fathers going, ugh. <laughs> All month. Okay. So yesterday, Elon Musk, he was on the Joe Rogan show, and uh, he talked about Quite a bit. Let's just let's set this up with the first clip. What was it ultimately that led you to make the decision to do it? I mean, this is going to sound uh, somewhat melodramatic, but I was worried about that that it was having a corrosive effect on civilization. Uh, that it was uh, just having a bad a bad impact. Okay. And you know what? That would make sense because a lot of the time people, every person says, right, well, I want to make a difference. That's why I do what I do. Well, you could do that and you don't have to run a multi-billion dollar enterprise. You yeah. know, I've always said with this, this is a business that we run. Uh, unlike a lot of conservative media entities, it's not a nonprofit. And by the way, we're funded by viewers like you. Do consider joining Mug Club at lighterwithcredit.com slash Mug Club. That's what allows us to do this. We have full half of the show. Uh, Alex Jones, of course, who everyone else uh, ran like their hair was on fire, and we, we say, nope, you know what, hey, we want him on our team. Brian Callen, you have uh, you have Josh here all the time. We have the Hodge twins. Nick we have a Friday show, Nick oh, DiPaolo, every single guns day. Gear. Yeah, guns and gear. Um, so I get it. This is a business, but it's not just business. However, if you, have, you look at Elon Musk, he did risk something. He didn't need to buy Twitter. If anything, it might have harmed him financially, right? There was a risk there. This was not a guy who needed to purchase it. He bought it when it was losing money. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And as far as we know, it may still be losing money. So um, he talked about, too, how the left was using Twitter to spread its message. So the point is, I believe what he's saying there because I look at what he risked. When people say, I'm trying to help, the, I want to do better for the world, and all they do is line their pockets. Like a perfect example, Al Gore. Al Gore sitting on the board at Apple. He only makes money off of that if... You know, if climate change is not the existential threat that you believe it to be, Al Gore's out of a job. Sort of like if racism were to go away, which it largely has in the Western world, Al Sharpton is out of a job. Also, if anyone requires someone who's literate with prompter, Al Sharpton's out of a job. <laughs> <laughs> he's not good. Yeah, he's not good. He's got a, he's got a word problem. So uh, Elon Musk got into his vision kind of for the platform, right, and that he discussed how there was go a government collusion under Twitter, which he suspected. But now I keep getting confused. Twitter X. If I say Twitter or X, just guys, you can comment below. You can admonish me yourself because I'm probably going to go back and forth here. Um, he also talked about how, and having spent time, of course, in, in California, 
I thought this was pretty illuminating, how Twitter was exporting San Francisco's mind virus to the world. If you've walked around downtown San Francisco, right near the ex-FKA Twitter headquarters, it's a zombie apocalypse. Now you have to say, well, what philosophy led to that outcome? And that philosophy was being piped to Earth. You know, a philosophy that would be ordinarily quite niche and geographically constrained, so that that the sort of the fallout uh, area key. would be limited, um, was effectively given an information a weapon, um, a tech, uh, inf information technology weapon to propagate uh, what is essentially a mind virus to the rest of Earth. Um, and the outcome of that mind virus is very clear if you walk around the streets of downtown San Francisco. It is the end of civilization. And, and this is important because you'll hear a lot of people say, well, you know, you have fringe liberals, right? You have them on both sides. Okay. All right. Let's, let's, let's go with that. Let's say that the view that children, you know, at drag shows is fringe, even though everyone in the DNC supports it. Let's say that uh, puberty blockers uh, for children, let's say that like a 90% marginal tax rate. Um, let's say that all of these ideas would be considered fringe or, extreme, or abortion up until including birth. Okay, but if those fringe liberals are in charge of 90 plus percent of the information on planet Earth, is it still fringe? Mm -mm. So let's go to overlay G1 here, Matt. I'm going to go in a little bit of a different uh, order. Uh, if you look at San Francisco, Silicon Valley, we're sort of using it interchangeably. They host the big tech headquarters for Twitter or X, Google, which means YouTube, Apple, Facebook, Meta, which means Instagram. That's all in effectively one small region of Earth. And then you look at the employees, including the higher up executives, they donated entirely, entirely to Democrats in 2022, 99.73% to 0.27%. By the way, there's a rounding error of plus or minus 0.27%. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say that one person got fired for sure. Right. What? It's just, <laughs> just like, think, typo. think about Nazi propaganda. Was everyone in, uh, in Germany a Nazi? Of course not. No. But the propaganda leaving the country, guess who was in charge of the information, of the messaging? Do I think that it's a mainstream view of America that there should be drag shows on Main Street and at the Children's Public Library? No. But it is, it, it is a diehard view. It is a fundamental tenet of the leftist worldview, which is held with, with almost hallowed regard from people at big tech. And, of course, those in the DNC who work with them. And I think that's why this interview was so important. He's talking with a guy, Joe Rogan, who was admonished by Jen Psaki. And I also believe Karen Jump here saying we really hope that Spotify does more to, uh, to, uh, to uh, make sure that Joe Rogan is not spreading misinformation. Think about that. Insane. From the office of the president of the United States. That, yes. That comes. The official representative whose yeah. their, their role is to speak. In the White House. That's to the press. crazy. So you're right, you're talking about a guy who came about these views later in life, mm -hmm. speaking to a guy who's coming to the right later in life. Mm -hmm. You know, guys like Tim Poole, Russell Brand, these people, it's happening all over the place. Yeah. People are starting to think like adults. Yeah. Uh, people of influence. Yeah. No, I, th I you know, think. Trump's sway with the black community. There's a lot of, there's a lot of change happening. That's such a, that's such a. This is a generational thing. They've yeah. really complimented by insulting them. <laughs> yeah. I think it's so sweet that you're now acting like a grown-up. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, the cl classic De Dennis Miller line, if you're, you've reached a certain age and you haven't thought about such things, then you've lived an asshole's life. Yes. <laughs> yes. Well, and, you know, I'm glad these guys have come around. No, it's They're true, sitting though. there across from one another. Yeah. Well, we don't have to agree on everything, but I think uh, free speech is a big one. And certainly people who can be in positions of control. Uh, and this is also, by the way, why I, I want to go back. Remind me to go back to the idea of nonprofits and 501c3s, because I know we have Mr. Spencer on, so we might have to, to clip this along. So Elon also uh, went on to say that under Jack Dorsey, uh, Twitter, which is now X, was functioning effectively as a state publication, like probably Probably Jack didn't really know, know this, but the degree to which Twitter was simply um, an arm of the government was not well understood by the public. And uh, it, it was, there was no, it was whatever the official government, I mean, it was like Pravda, basically. Um, you know, it's a state publication is the way to think of old Twitter. It was a state publication. That's good. Well, that was one of the things about the old Twitter was the propaganda and yeah. the adherence to whatever the CDC was saying and the dismissing of legitimate scientists. Now, people will say, and this is why, just so you know, and Joe Rogan is, is the biggest uh, show on earth. 
So this is not at all uh, to uh, diminish what he does. But this is why with this program, we make all the references publicly available because these two people are having a conversation, an organic conversation. And that's great. That's important. We also want to make sure that you are prepared when the media tries to fact check and say, that's not true, that you have the references of bibliography right in front of you. That's why we put the link in the description and you can see all of the references uh, at louderwithcrowder.com because they just discussed those. Now, I'm going to tell you, that's correct. The media is going to try and say once it picks up steam that it's not. That's why we make the references available. It's just a different approach. Uh, the Twitter files verified, by the way, that the FBI colluded with Twitter to suppress stories specifically at the Biden administration's request. Most notable, the Hunter Biden laptop story. Mm -hmm. So when that came out, we're going, why was this throttled on Twitter? Jack Dorsey gave an explanation. Well, it could be misinformation. And of course, they never reinstated it, which affected the entire outcome of the election, by the way. If that story was allowed on social media everywhere, Meta, Twitter, Facebook, right, Instagram, all those places, that was allowed to proliferate just organically as any other story. The election is different regardless of changing the election laws, regardless of mass mail-in voting. Joe Biden doesn't win a single swing state. Think about that. The Hunter Biden laptop story, that didn't come from just Twitter thinking it was misinformation. Who determines what is misinformation? In this case, it was the FBI. Elon also goes on to uh, uh, make the claim. We will see if this is verified here. Spoiler alert, it is. That's foreshadowing. <laughs> <laughs> like, Spoiler alert, it's a dude. <laughs> we're aware. Yes, we're aware. <laughs> we see you. We are so aware. Seen. Uh, he also uh, makes the claim that this was the result of liberals suppressing uh, anything to the right of their beliefs, also in collusion with government. Basically, oppression of... Um, any any views that would even I would say could be considered middle of the road, um, but certainly anything on the the right. I'm not talking about like like far right. I'm just talking mildly right. The people like Republicans were suppressed at ten times the rate of Democrats. Um, now that's because uh, old Twitter was fundamentally controlled by the far left. Everything is to the right if you're far left. Everything is to the right. Now here's the thing. I wouldn't say far left. There's the one correction I would make. Mainstream left. Mm. Mainstream left is far left. And just to be clear, when people exactly. try to say, oh, they've gone far right and gone far left. No, the right has gone slightly left and the left is far left. So if you're looking at the Overton window where it shifted, okay, here are Republicans. I guess I should, it's my right, you're left. So maybe I should do it. Okay, here are Republicans. I have to do it in reverse. Here were Democrats, <laughs> conservatives, liberals. We're using the American um, kind of nomenclature here. All right. It didn't do this. It did this. Mm. Mm. Let me give you some examples, because that's a big myth that a lot of people use to fence it and say, I'm talking about the far left. Okay. We talk about uh, no cash bail. Okay, that's a big one. Tolerance of crime in big cities. Okay, you talk about not just, you know, at this point, not just talking about weed, black tar heroin being legal, you know, like in your home state. Uh, oh, yeah. Ideology, which includes <laughs> hormone therapy and gender surgeries for kids, right? Cities and states becoming safe havens for uh, trans minors, and by the way, teachers hiding children from their parents if they want to go into uh, hormone. Well, if they want to undergo trans, if they want to undergo sex reassignment surgery, let's call it what it is, or if they want to go to a hormone, a, 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 a puberty blocking clinic. I don't know if it's called puberty blocking clinic. You get the point. The point here is: look at all of those policies. Now, name me one, one, just one. Comment below. National member of the DNC who isn't on board with that. You want to say, oh, oh, everyone has gone uh, extreme. We're talking about as recently as 2010. Barack Obama ran on an anti-gay marriage platform. The only president to enter into office who was pro-gay marriage was Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. Historically. Historically. Yeah. Think about that. Now, I don't believe Barack Obama any further than I can throw him, which, by the way, is pretty far. <laughs> <laughs> you're pretty you're pretty strong. Oh, he's bird bone. He's pretty light. Yeah. Now, Michelle, I'd need a wind up. I might need an addle addle. Grab her by her dick and swing her around. <laughs> like Thor's hammer. <laughs> <laughs> by the way, Elon sounds very high? No. Oh. I was gonna say I was gonna say tired. Yeah, he does. Tired yeah. and just like when he's talking about the end of civilization and in, in seeing a you know precursor in, in San Francisco, it just seems like he's so distraught. Yeah, it does. Like, well, it's behind the grin. It seems like there's more. He knows something that he he's not quite sharing. Yeah, and there's leaves, a deeper uh, issue. Yeah, he leaves trails of breadcrumbs if you see things that he retweets. For example, mm. things like you know. 
cabals of pedophiles. Now, that doesn't mean that we're talking about some Satan worshiping spirit. What he's talking about is cabal? People, in per, people in positions of power who have a vested interest, for example, in allowing uh, open borders because of sex trafficking in which they partake. Things like that. Things that have been verifiably proven to a small degree in individual cases. I mean, Epstein, I think, is, I mean, I think it's relevant. I think it's relevant that the most powerful people in the world were visiting Sex Island. 26 times. 26 times. That's just Bill Clinton. That's two dozen. That's two baker's dozen. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the math is, yeah, it seems, I was doing the math. I haven't been to Chick-fil-A 26 times. <laughs> Unbelievable. But they move you through faster. They have a very efficient drive through Very good drive through Yeah, very good drive through <laughs> But think about it. So now you have, we had Barack Obama, who was, uh, now I believe that marriage is between a man and a woman. That's why I'm married, clearly, to what is a woman. <laughs> She's a woman, come on. No, 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 don't get all wee-weed up. I'm married to a real life lady. Right. <laughs> fine lady. Isn't that, isn't that right, Michelle? Michael. I'm Michelle. a fine lady. You heard it. <laughs> <laughs> so we went from anti-gay marriage Barack Obama to puberty blockers for children. And then really, you've been with us the last two years. Sex reassignment surgery for children and hiding the children from the parents if they don't want their children to undergo sex reassignment surgery. Oh, and by the way, parental rights are just a, a, a it's a byproduct, it's a, con a construct of white supremacy. So is the nuclear family. We have not gone far right and far left. We have all gone left and the left has gone incredibly far left, which makes them now the mainstream left. I'm not going to use the term the far left because I don't know it would be considered far left. Hold on a second. Joe Biden supports gender reassignment for children so does Saki. So does Karen Jumpier. So does Kamala Harris. So does Gavin Newsom. So if hold on, we can't say that's far left, right? These are these are the most prominent national figures. What would be far left? For crying out loud, Marx wouldn't be further to the left of them socially. And as a general rule of thumb, anything leftist uh, throughout history, it's about as useful as a mistake we've made. We were not above Chet, who's, you know, Charles yeah. Xavier's brother. Yeah. We ha we've hired him. We have him on retainer. Leftism is about as useful as Chet, our resident X-Man. Come on, Joe Lewis. I can't turn. That's why he had the. That's why he had the wiggles in the office today. Not getting a lot of exercise. <laughs> no. of Joe Lewis isn't doing him any favors. No, though. he's not. No. He's kind of a dick. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> you could give him a tug. You're the, the one who dove into rut. a show. You're the one who dove into an empty pool. <laughs> <laughs> um. So Musk also uh, went on to say, and this is kind of the macro picture that uh, under his ownership, um, X. He laid out a vision, which is good. You have people who just complain and don't lay out a vision for the way things should be, and, and I don't necessarily know that this is detailed, but I think it's a good start. He said X, Twitter, should represent the collective consciousness of humanity. That is that X, FK, Twitter, um, should uh, represent the sort of collective consciousness of humanity. So now that, that means that there are going to be views on there that you don't like. Um, or disagree with, um, but that's humanity. But the Taliban is on Twitter, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's a valid question. Valid. It is funny coming with that wig on. Yeah, it's just a little funny. Who was he? Was he? he was was he Ric Flair? What was it's uh, hard to tell because he's playing. He has a Puerto Rico baseball jersey on, which I don't know who. I don't get. Oh it. no, Gabe Williams. It's too obscure room. a reference. Yeah, it's too obscure. Uh, yeah, it's probably a, a pun. I I'm sure I'm probably missing something. Hey, so he talks about humanity. You know who doesn't <laughs> yeah, care? Williams pissed off. No, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know who doesn't care about humanity? And he commented on this too, a little bit like the tortoise in the race. He does seem tired, but he commented on who doesn't care about humanity. Elon Musk specified George Soros. Soros, I don't know. I mean, he had a very difficult upbringing, um, and uh, I, in my opinion, he fundamentally hates humanity. That's my opinion. 
Really? Yeah. I mean, well, he's doing things that erode the fabric of civilization. Yeah. Now, can we confirm? That's why we make all the references available. Soros spent about $40 million on uh, leftist DA campaigns all over America, right, to be soft on crime, uh, to be clear. Soros DAs in this country, they represent about one in five in America, but they preside over 40% of the nation's murders. And he also funded nearly just $15 million to pro-Hamas protests. This is a guy, of course, who's a eugenicist who does believe that uh, overpopulation is a problem. He's funded all kinds of studies and funded uh, movements to try and uh, reduce population of Earth. This is a guy who also most notably pointed out where the Jews were hiding, you know, to the Germans during the Holocaust. Uh, This is not a good guy. (laughs) But he is a looker. Yes, he is. Yes. He has a, a face that only a mother could hate. (laughs) <laughs> oh, uh, speaking of a face, uh, so Rogan was going as his doppelganger. Oh, that makes sense. That's oh, right. Oh, oh, that's so okay. Funny. Not bad. For that guy Not now. bad. It's okay. very meta. It's yeah. very meta. All right. So my question to you is: Look, let me ask you this. See, seeing where he lines up, do you think that Twitter has improved under Musk's watch? And uh, how far of a way do you think that it has to go? How confident are you with him at the tiller of the ship? I think that this shows, uh, this does show, this was more than just, I'm a conservative, you know, delivering a red meat line to a camera for a few clicks on Instagram. This was a guy I do think who was really kind of bearing his soul, and I think a development. It doesn't mean that Twitter's, I think that pragmatically Twitter is a little bit rougher in some ways. I don't think he's really fixed the bots. I think the trending issues probably have a long way to go. But the heart of it, of wanting free speech to exist there, is a move in the right direction. There are only two places really doing that right now. That's Rumble. And, uh, and hopefully Twitter. But Rumble has been a lot more consistent with that, uh, which is, of course, why Mug Club is Rumble. Mug, Rumble is Mug Club. You can join Mug Club. We've already talked about that. But um, we're really happy to be in a partnership with them. Yeah. And uh, you know, I do think that Twitter has, has improved quite a bit. You weren't active on Twitter before, Josh. I but- wasn't. I, uh, I hated Twitter. I yeah. just I couldn't. First of all, I wasn't good at it. Yeah. I still am not good at it. Right. Uh, as a comedian, I'm supposed to be making jokes, and all I do is share videos of stuff I'm angry about. But, yeah. Or baseball. <laughs> and no one cares. Uh, but yeah, no, I, now that uh, it's a different, it's kind of a different environment. A lot of, uh, a lot of conservative voices are, are back on Twitter. Yeah. Um, I know a lot of people have left for that threads thing or. Um, Not a lot. Or no. whatever it is. But some have. It's but not it a huge seems, amount. It seems like a, <laughs> it seems like a place where people are, um, you know, able to say more right leaning things now. So yeah. Uh, I was just seeing this on CNN right now where they're covering pro-Hamas protests. Can I see what this is? I just showed a kid. How do you think this ends? When you're working on the amount of precedent that there is um, with Israel, with Gaza, with the Palestinians, with Hamas, I, I don't foresee this ending in a way that will feel very final. Israel has lost. The innocent civilians in Gaza have lost. Nobody can win a war like this. And so what does the end look like? It, it looks like loss. Where do you find the hope in a situation like this? I have no hope that this conflict will be resolved in the next century, like not at all. I think this will be an almost immutable fact of the Middle East, uh, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. This is where I turn to religion and prayer, God, and, you know, really the, the core of Judaism, and that's... So, look, let me, let me uh, address it. This is one of the, I agree with them, the premise. I agree with the premise that this is not a conflict that is going to end. Now, sometimes you'll have people say that, and you can comment, uh, comment below. They'll say, so this conflict is not uh, you know, going to end, and it's nothing but loss. Okay. So if you believe that you're in a conflict that will never end, the goal is to ensure that the enemy incurs the most amount of loss as possible while you mitigate yours. If it's never going to end, then why would you call for a ceasefire? If you acknowledge it's never going, it's like saying, yeah, I know this is a tyrant. I know it's a tyrant who's, who's going to take everything anyway, so let me give him some to start. Imagine if Winston Churchill said, you, you cannot negotiate with a tiger when your head is in its mouth, so just give him everything. <laughs> <laughs> you can say it's never going to end, therefore roll over, or it's never going to end, so you accept the violence. Wherever you line up on this conflict, I agree, it's never going to end. I think a silly... A silly uh, thought process to develop from that. I think a silly conclusion to which you come is, therefore, let's try and have peace. You just said you can't give peace a chance. Yeah. So then don't. 
They say it's never going to end, and they want a ceasefire. Yeah. They give a ceasefire right now, and it's never going to end, and people are just dying for nothing. Exactly. You know? People, are, All these people that were sad about I'm sad about it. Of course. It's not a great thing. I'm not happy about it, but yeah. they all die in vain if... If you just cease fire, and you got to get rid of Hamas as, yeah, as best you, gotta, you can. Then another, it's what's best for another Palestine. group of initials will pop up under you know a different yeah. banner. But which are, okay, since we do have Spencer uh, coming up here in a little bit, we're going. Let's address the uh, Joe Biden emails uh, tomorrow. Yeah. Uh, just to be clear, let me just give you a quick recap. Kay, uh, there was a lawsuit by the uh, Southern Legal Foundation. Now they just uncovered that Joe Biden sent eighty-two thousand emails. Using pseudonyms during his time as VP, uh, only Fox Business was the one who broadcast it. Nothing in media. We're not going to show the clip, but we do know that there are some emails in there from 2014 to 2019 uh, when Hunter served at Burisma. Uh, emails regarding that. We do know that there were emails in 2015 with uh, uh, Vice Presidential aide John Flynn um, that included Hunter on these emails that specifically addressed Ukraine. There were at least 10 emails that CC'd Hunter Biden in relation uh, in many ways to Ukraine, to Burisma, and of course the Ukrainian uh uh, prosecutor uh, Victor, I believe Victor Shokin being dismissed. These are these are issues that are addressed in these emails, and the National Archives said that they are going to be uh, producing more on a monthly basis. So I don't want to uh, not do this topic justice, and I think there's probably going to be more tomorrow to cover. So let me know if you'd like us to cover that tomorrow, uh, and if you have any information, feel free to send it in uh, or comment below because we're kind of still collecting the data. All right. So to lead into what a war in Gaza right now, the ground invasion, because you, Josh is, is here. And, uh, of course, he uh, has done. How many, did you do three tours, two tours? Three tours to Afghanistan. Wow. Thank, thank you for, thank your, you service. for your service. Thank oh, you, I sir. mean, it was a it was Pops! It was I did. College. I did. I got it out. Can I have my pen back? Okay. You can. Where is it? Can, oh, I got yeah, it. All right. All right. I was too busy. I was too busy. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to die. Whose dad didn't thank you for your service? Because well, Josh, I my dad was a career military fighter pilot, retired colonel. So I'm no one cares. I'm, it doesn't I've, mean that I've you... lived under that banner my whole life, and I'm quick to thank. It's like he said. It's like he <laughs> says. It's like, oh, I'm I'm a quarter black, so I can say the N word. No, that's right. right. Thank him. <laughs> thank him for your service, and you move on. So this Thanks, is Gramps Crowder. Yes. <laughs> this was someone we were asked. What media outlets do you trust in relation to the Israel uh, Palestine Israel Hamas conflict? Really, um, I get it. I get it. There's been misinformation on both sides, and that would, be a, that would be a tactic of war that would be pivotal today. I mean, we just saw those tactics of war being used by Twitter, according to Elon Musk. Why wouldn't a, a government military use it? So let me ask you this, though. You probably heard about um, uh, Jabalia, the refugee camp there, right? There was a strike. Okay, so that's probably what you've heard to begin with. Now, let me ask you this. In your mind right now, take just a second. If you're on audio, actually take a second in your mind's eye. I want you to picture what a refugee camp looks like. Okay, what do you think of? All right, now we can bring up, do you think of something like this? All right, most likely. Mm -hmm. Or do you think of something like this? This is the refugee camp we are discussing in Jabalia. No, oh, a city? Yes, a city. A city. A, a city, like a, yeah. An yeah. apartment block? Yeah. It's, it's bigger it, than the Chaz in right. Seattle. Yes, it's compar comparing, uh, comparing, for example, a homeless tents in Austin in a park to the Upper East Side. So <laughs> let's contrast that to well. begin with, right? You've heard about this refugee camp, uh, or most likely you can ask me. I, 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 I'll ask you. You can comment if you have heard about the refugee camp in Gaza. So let's set this up. Yesterday, the IDF claimed responsibility, which right away should tip you off because they said the hospital, that was not us. They said this one guilty for striking the Jabalia refugee camp in Gaza. But even if that uh, uh, Hamas commander was there amidst all those Palestinian refugees who are in that in that Jabalia refugee camp, he looks like Colonel Israel Sanders. Still went yes. ahead and, and dropped a bomb there, <laughs> attempting to kill nice this Halloween Hamas uh, this Hamas, Hamas commander, knowing that a lot of innocent civilians, men, women, and children, presumably would be killed. Is that what I'm hearing? That's not what you're hearing, Wolf. We again were focused on this. Commander, again, who you'll get more data who this man was, uh, killed many, many Israelis. Uh, we're doing everything we can. These are, it's a very complicated battle space. There could be infrastructure there. There could be tunnels there. Uh, we're still looking into it, and we'll give you more data as the hour moves ahead. Now, just to be clear, everyone here is saddened when innocent life is lost. Just to be clear. Mm -hmm. And I do get that not every single person in Gaza or Palestinian is uh, supportive of Hamas or wants to eradicate all the Jews as their uh, representatives who were elected do, just to be clear. But 
It also does matter when you have one side using human beings as human shields. Again, you think of a refugee camp. You don't think of a major city with shops and bodegas and convenience stores and whatever their equivalent written in that Arabic right to quick trip is. <laughs> probably it's still quick trip. It's the, probably seven. The stop and rob. Yes. The stop. stop and rob. <laughs> stop and rob hijab. Now, it's, it's a franchise. So uh, the, me, the media, of course. It's a grab and blow. Media, Twitter. <laughs> they were all flooded with videos immediately claiming that the IDF indiscriminately murdered, some of them claiming deliberately murdered innocent women and children. Here's how they painted it. Part of the Jabalia refugee camp, among the largest and most densely populated in Gaza, now turned to rubble. The latest target of Israel's relentless air campaign. Israel dropped five bombs with no warning. The United Nations is saying there is nowhere safe for Palestinians right now. Right away that says the Ministry of Health, 400 Palestinians, mostly women and children. There's nowhere safe. It's almost, almost, uh, some Jews feel like there's nowhere safe when you have a government saying our goal is to eradicate all Jews. Mm -hmm. Yeah, how, what's that security blanket? Yeah, like? it's like, oh, can I just, you know what, I'll just go on over here. No, 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 that's still in the eradication zone. <laughs> Where is not in the eradication? No, eradicate means everywhere. It's all mine. We're there's white. no what's mine is yours. It's what's yours is mine. What's mine is mine. Because you are a Jew. So, Pierce well, Morgan. When your old rubble looks just like your new rubble, yes. it's kind of hard to tell. <laughs> Did you renovate in here? Yeah. 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 Oh, same rubble. This is, this is uh, I guess this is modern uh, rustic chic. That'll be, that'll be rebuilt by next week. <laughs> it's contemporary Arab world since forever. So, I get we're talking about Israel. Okay, in Palestine, the whole thing. It's not a real country. All right. So, Pierce Morgan also forcefully uh, condemned this action, writing, Israel deliberately bombing Gaza's largest refugee camp, even if a Hamas commander was there, is outrageous and indefensible. Okay? So what do we know about this refugee camp? All right, well, here's a couple of fast facts for you. Number one, this was a refugee camp established in uh, 1948. Uh, it was established after Egypt conquered Gaza during the 1948 Arab-Israeli war. I said Gaza because I was still in Pierce Morgan mind. <laughs> Gaza, Gaza, Hamas, Gaza. I still have a little bit of Macho Man Randy Savage from yesterday. Was all night. <laughs> They're in Gaza, yeah. Tell you that gets that gets the Macho Man a little bit irritated. No, I don't want to be in my Arab Israeli war prisoner. No, because the cream rises to the top. That's the IDF. When the IDF comes knocking on your door, you're gonna know who the real Macho Man is. <laughs> It was all night. My pops was there. I was doing it. Look, just, just to add some levity here, with my kids, and uh, we were trick-or-treating, and I put it on, and I was doing it, and they loved it. Then at one point, I take off my glasses, and I go, hey, it's Dada. And my son goes, no. <laughs> Dada has no fun at all. He goes, be macho, man. All right, I guess I'm not going to have a voice tomorrow. Can to be horse? Yeah. You were like getting in, in the character. On All night. Out yesterday. If I took it out, Hilarious. if I took anything off, like, no, 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 macho man. All right. One of the dads on one of the porches says, you keep that up. You'll talk to nobody tomorrow. Yes. <laughs> that was a guy who was drinking an IPA in his porch. Yeah, because he likes beer that tastes like soap. Yeah. Macho man doesn't like beer that tastes like soap. No. Figuratively speaking. All right. <laughs> So this is where far That's away macho man being articulate. <laughs> Figuratively speaking. <laughs> so the Jabali refugee camp, okay, established 1948 after the Arab-Israeli uh, war. Okay. These aren't refugees. The context here, what I'm trying to tell you is fleeing Israeli airstrikes. Okay. It's located just two to three miles uh, from Gaza's north border. Is right. that the uh, area where the uh, Israelis told everybody to evacuate like two or three weeks ago? Right. And so Israel oh. sent some warnings to the south. They have been sending so, warnings. But no to the warnings. Five bombs, no warnings. But it needs to, well, you need a warning then. You need, you, need, you gotcha. need to do continual warnings because that's what people do in war. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You need to be. We were doing it wrong. Yeah. Well, it, now you need to have your own Paul Revere on retainer for the other guy. <laughs> And nowadays, the, the rules Jews of engagement. The Jews are coming. The Jews are coming. <laughs> that would be best if your Paul Revere is macho man. And like, hey, listen, I got to tell you something, Kate. Yeah, the Jews are coming. They're bringing hellfire with them with the macho man. Yeah, the Jews are coming. Yeah. <laughs> and they're wearing fringe. <laughs> and they're wearing fringe. And at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what you do with the idea of no, you're just going to be a Palestinian kid throwing rocks at an Israeli tank. Yeah. <laughs> 
It was all night. It was four hours. <laughs> <laughs> it it never it got old. There was new material in every house. <laughs> keep it up. There's not going to be a Thursday show. <laughs> I had a kid sneeze. He, oh. he was so fast with the macho man. He walked up, sneezed in my face like it was a bioweapon, and then wiped it on my macho suit. What? I don't know. I don't know if he had a cold. I mean, he can't do anything about it. There's I, no absorbency in that suit. No, it's a it was sauna slick. suit. All right. <laughs> that kid was working with the Iron Sheik. Yes, he was. Yeah. <laughs> well, well do, you, do you remember when the Macho Man went up to the kid in the vampire suit and complimented him on his, on his outfit? Oh, the Dracula suit? Yeah, the Dracula. Yeah. That's right. He was on, anyway, it's a whole thing. He's just trying to cue me up for more Macho Man. He was the one who <laughs> yeah. the kid. He's like, hey, do you want Macho Man? And I'm like, do you want Macho Man to whatever it is, you know, step in a bucket of snakes? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> Well, I guess because Macho Man's pops wants me to step in a bucket of snakes, I don't want to disappoint the kids, no. All night. All right. Here's another key fact, okay? Uh, the camp, the refugee camp, is completely indistinguishable from the rest of the city. Here's an aerial picture showing how the refugee camp, showing oh you my exactly how it blends in with the rest. Even the media, they can't agree on what... The borders of the camp actually are. Wherever the bombs fell. Yes. <laughs> it's pretty easy to me. And the, it's an urban environment. Again, you would think refugee camp, you think tents. No, it's incredibly densely populated. It's about 82,000, 82,000 give or take people per square kilometer. To give you context, New York City is about 10,000 people per square kilometer. Wow. Dang. So you need to keep this in context. Well, we're, Okay, if terrorists are setting up tunnels and rockets... And they're doing it in an area where there are as many women and children as possible. Again, this is war. Do you, do you allow them to kill your women and children? Or do you go after the terrorists? And I'm sorry, but collateral damage unfortunately results with women and children because they're firing their rockets deliberately using women and children as human shields. Look at those maps. That's where they picked. That's where they picked to set this up. And the media just right away, this is completely indefensible. I disagree. I don't think it's completely indefensible when you understand context. Here's another key fact. Uh, this has been a target, this refugee camp, for the IDF since the very start of the war. The IDF has claimed that Hamas, their leadership, have used uh, Jabalia to shelter themselves, to hide. Now, there could be bias here from the IDF. That's why I ask you, what sources do you think are reliable? Now, I tend to, I tend to, when Hamas IDF or government of Israel, I tend to give more weight to the government of Israel, but I, I do certainly do not think that they're unbiased. But it's because Hamas, you know, they brag about murdering innocent women and children. So it, it's not that much of a stretch when the IDF says, by the way, they're murdering their own women and children. We do know also, according to Al Jazeera, that this refugee camp was used for Hamas activities regularly. Here's Al Jazeera in 2014. It says, Gaza's internal tunnel network is reportedly even more complex than cross-border routes and involves multiple branches that run under refugee camps uh, in Khan Yunus, Jabalia, other densely populated areas. They hide weaponry and they are designed for Hamas leadership to remain protected and mobile. This is from Al Jazeera in 2014, which means this has been going on since at least then, where it was not up for debate, because you know Al Jazeera really wants to paint them in a more positive light. Here's a Hamas terrorist giving uh, a Russia Today journalist, and by the way, I, just so you know, I'm glad that Rumble allows Russia Today to be on their platform, because I want to hear what Hamas terrorists have to say. That's the beauty of freedom of speech. That's the beauty of being representative of all of humanity, warts and all. Here's a Hamas terrorist giving a Russia Today journalist a guided tour of those tunnels. Okay, so here's the thing. If you think it's indefensible that any type of strike results in the death of, 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 of women and children, that is a position to hold. I understand that there are people who believe that there should be no war ever whatsoever. However, what is not a defensible position is the idea that this was simply a refugee camp that was targeted with the intent of killing women and children. How do we know? 
from Hamas's own representatives, from Al Jazeera, from every source that we have available that lets us know that terrorists were there. I get now, could there be a middle ground? Could the IDF have said, nah, you know what, there's probably another way to extract this person, but who cares at this point we're past hitting the F it button? Maybe. But that's the danger of going out half cocked with very little of the information and not providing historical context. All the references we will make available for you at Ladder with Crowder.com. Link in the description. Comment. But you, a, you ask at the outset, what is your picture in your mind? My mind immediately goes to these people using women and children all the time. I, I never accept their explanation because it is not a matter of opinion. It's not bias. They've proven themselves so. Yeah. I, mean, I, don't, I don't understand why people still believe that. They're lucky they didn't get a Moab with tunnels that strong. I don't know if people believe it. I think we've reached, you know, there used to be, the, the argument used to be people believed uh, that they weren't using women and children as human shields. Uh, and what I see from the left now, they're not denying it, but they're saying ceasefire anyway. You want yeah. to believe that yeah. it's not true. It's like. No, I think they're accepting nature. the premise. I think they're going, sure, oh, yeah, they use they them are. as women and children as shields. And sure, they do do that. And they're terrorists. But you know what? Ceasefire anyway. I saw I, someone arguing the other day about that. They were, were saying, if, a, if, a, if somebody kidnapped your, uh, kidnapped your mom and had a gun to their head and you were a cop. Would you still shoot and kill your mom? And I was like, that's a terrible, like they're just accepting that they're using human shields and they, st they still shouldn't. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, when they use when they say things like we value death more than you value life. I mean, come on, folks. Well, actually, okay, it's we a modern a, we society on the other side of the line. It's a completely different culture. We have our guest who is going to be here in a little bit. So before that, we want to set this up regarding, uh, you know, the land invasion that has started in Gaza. And what I mean by that is there was, you know, air, there, there were airstrikes going on. The war in the Middle East is obviously intensifying quite a bit. And so uh, we were thinking who would be better to run us through it than before our guest, of course, Mr. Spencer. Uh, we have our own resident ranger here, which brings us to a new segment we call Josh Knows War. <laughs> we spared no expense. So, and you'll probably be better to oh. interview our, our guest, uh, uh, Mr. Spencer, on here. I have all of his credentials uh, in a couple of uh, minutes. But first, let me just rattle this off so people kind of understand the context. You know what a ground war looks like having done three tours. Yeah. And this has only really started uh, the ground invasion with Gaza as opposed to airstrikes uh, four days ago. I believe we have a clip. Israel's military forces expanded its ground activities in Gaza as it prepares for a full-scale ground invasion. Fireballs lit up northern Gaza's blacked-out skyline. Their blasts rolling past seconds later. Israel's defense forces said fighter jets struck 150 targets underground, including Hamas's maze of hundreds of miles of tunnels, while columns of Israeli tanks rolled into the strip. All right, so you guys have probably been following this. You know uh, that uh, this has been going on for about four days. And, of course, not everyone has supported uh, the ground invasion. And that's an opinion that people, of course, can hold that's valid. Uh, for, example, uh, for, for example, for example, Emmanuel Macron. Macron. Not a fan. Oh. Macron. He said, a ground invasion, it is aimed at terrorist groups that are totally identified. It is their choice. That matches the description I just gave. If it is a massive ground invasion which puts civilian lives at risk, then I think that it is a mistake, and it is a mistake for Israel as well. Let's just think of how stupid those two paragraphs are. Mm. If it's aimed at terrorist groups that are totally identified, it is their choice. If it is a massive ground invasion which puts civilian lives at risk... Ah, la, 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 la. Did you spot the stupid? <laughs> what if it's aimed at terrorists who are easily identified behind the women and children, human shield? Mm -hmm. What would Napoleon do? He would fuck people up. Yes, that's what he would do. Also, I like the country. wouldn't Christian. stand for this shit for one moment. He would not, but I am what you call, how you say? Uh, a pussy. Uh, I am a pussy boy, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I am a... <laughs> Because it doesn't protect Israel in the long term, and because it is incompatible with the respect of civilians, of the humanitarian and national law, and the law of war, I believe this would be a mistake. We actually go now live to Macron's cabinet for commentary. <laughs> you hear that laugh? <laughs> that was exactly how he laughed. <laughs> That's not how he laughed. Uh, <laughs> Kill the dog. Yes. <laughs> are you pissing on the fireplace? Did you say you are with Hamas? <laughs> the, uh, 
Our guest. Be our guest. <laughs> <laughs> Try the hummus. It's delicious. <laughs> <laughs> Don't believe me? Ask the dishes. <laughs> Wait, the, the dishes are Jews. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's the, the clock. Trying to eradicate my dishes. <laughs> the clock is just a former Nazi. <laughs> All right. In the he UN. Had little, he had a little mustache like that. He did have a little mustache. Yeah, 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 <laughs> Silence, Hitler. <laughs> he was supposed to have died in Argentine was it as a SS. <laughs> All right. That's a deep pull. Now, the UN Secretary General uh, Antonio Guterres also called for a ceasefire. To his epic suffering, make the delivery of aid easier and safer, and facilitate the release of hostages, I reiterate my appeal for an immediate humanitarian ceasefire. No, no. Look, here's the thing. Wherever you line up, you don't get to call for a ceasefire after the deliberate targeting of women and children to a record number. You don't get to then call, you don't get to rape somebody. You don't get to march into someone's house, shoot their family members, and then when the cops come, call for a ceasefire. That is akin to supporting terrorism. And rough <laughs> well, yeah, I'm sure we could fit Elon Omar in there. Uh. <laughs> so, despite pressure from the internet, here, just let's just hear the let's hear. Okay, so you hear their side. Now let's hear the the Jewish side. Here's Israel Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu saying, uh, uh, "Go fornicate yourself." Israel will not agree to a cessation of hostilities with Hamas after the horrific attacks of October 7th. Calls for a ceasefire are calls for Israel to surrender to Hamas, to surrender to terrorism, to surrender to barbarism. The Bible says that there is a time for peace and a time for war. This is a time for war. But whenever I hear barbarism, for some reason I still think of like just like a barber's union. <laughs> <laughs> we will not stand for haircuts yes, in this country. We will not stand for haircuts. Is it wrong that I want him to narrate every audiobook ever, ever again? <laughs> Netanyahu, what a voice. You know? He does have a pretty damn good voice. You know, he yeah. sounds like Dr. Grombois a little bit. When we were kids. Only with a Jewish accent? Yeah, with a Jewish accent. <laughs> so here, and this is sorry, because I wanted to go through this because our guest is waiting, but I really do want to get your perspective here uh, to get a better idea of how a ground invasion might actually unfold, what the IDF soldiers can expect. Um, we have our resident ranger here, Josh Firestone. Thank you for your service. And then we also have as a guest, uh, a guest, retired U.S. Army officer. I want to make sure I get all these right. He's a current uh, colonel in the uh, California State Guard. He is uh, chair of urban warfare studies at the Modern War Institute at West Point and author of Understanding Urban Warfare. I think I've covered it all. Mr. John Spencer. All right, John Spencer, can you hear me, see me, sir? Thank you for being here. I can see you and hear you. Thanks for having me. All right. Well, thank you. I apologize for the, uh, the Lion King introduction, but uh, we're okay with it. Now, <laughs> um, here, uh, before, because I really would like for you to speak with Josh. You know, Josh here has done uh, three tours um, of duty himself. And by the way, thank you both for your service. Uh, could you give uh, the viewing... Uh, audience, the person right now watching, listening, a bit of your background, um, kind of what it is that you do. Sure. So I spent 25 years in the Army as an infantry soldier, both as a soldier and an officer, two combat deployments to Iraq, one in the invasion, and then one in 2008 during the height of basically sectarian violence in Baghdad. And then I went into basically academics after my career where I've been studying all urban warfare from the ancient warfare to today. Uh, for over a decade in writing, have a podcast and, and 
uh, walking the ground. I go in and out of Ukraine. I go to Nagorno-Karabakh. I've been to Israel. I've been to many of these places that were viciously slaughtered. Uh, I've eaten lunch in Sardat and a lot of that. So I'm a student of all of this uh, and hopefully can help people understand what they're seeing, like you were talking about. Yeah, and not try to go crazy about it. Well, it's hard to, to sort of parse, you know, uh, reality from from fiction right now. Uh, and I understand why people don't trust either side as far as the media. J- Josh, what would be kind of if someone who's been on the ground, what would be your your main question as far as um, I, I guess what are the unknowns here? Well, for me, I was all my tours were in Afghanistan, and they were all after two thousand or two thousand nine or later. So it's a lot different than what you did, Colonel. And going into Iraq and and going through the invasion, um, I think we're kind of looking at a similar thing. At least from the outside, it appears to be a similar situation. And I'm kind of thinking, like, what what would be Israel's ultimate goal in this ground invasion going into Gaza? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. I think it's actually pretty clear, despite some of the comments from the political leaders, from the military guys and analysts of these type of operations, it's very clear. Destroy Hamas military capability so they can never do another October 7th, 9-11 event or send another rocket towards Israel civilians. You have to move forward. You have to destroy people, rockets, tunnels, everything. It's, it's actually a very clear-cut military objective as opposed to some of the other ones that I've seen. Like which which ones would you say are not necessarily clear cut? Uh, when you know, the day after, right? When you have to stay around and build a nation and, and try uh-huh. to instill democracy and things like that are foreign to that environment. Right. Uh, militaries can destroy other military capabilities. Militaries are horrible at building nations. That makes sense. Do you think there's no interest for Israel to rebuild anything after? coming through and or, or setting up a new government if they eradicate eradicate yeah if they uh, well hamas i'm pro eradicating they, hamas yeah, yeah if they destroy hamas and their hamas government in, in gaza well yes so the day day after right so that's always the question for any military any military operation israel says they have no intentions of governing gaza ever again mm. but yeah i mean hamas is not the only terrorist organization even in gaza right you have pji lion's den it's it's full of terrorist uh, so who governs it and then, again, doesn't become a threat again to Israel will be determine their approach. But right now, it's there's no other alternative. That's kind of the issue here, mm. too, is that everybody wants to talk about a ceasefire, all this. Like, there is no other alternative. Here's an alternative. Every Hamas member surrenders, and there's a complete yeah. disarmament of Hamas military capability in Gaza, which is literally, you can see it from Israel. It's not, it's not like it's... Some people have this ideal, again, like you said about the refugee camp, which is just a classification in which you can get more aid from the United Nations. Uh, you have an ideal of a refugee camp. It's not a, like a, a concrete city. And you have an ideal that Gaza is some faraway place from Israel. It's, it's literally in eyesight, and the rockets come and have come every day since October 7th out of Gaza heading towards an Isra- Israeli civilian site. Yeah, it would be like being in Manhattan and having, having rockets being felled from Hoboken. Um, yes. Let me uh, let ask you just as a layman, when you say this, because it seems like there can be no, the, the idea of ceasefire just seems so silly considering what happened right in, uh, uh, in October, we're now in November, so back in October, gosh, time's moves, moves It's quickly. almost a month now. Yeah. But wh- why was there such a delay as far as uh, going into, you know, Gaza, uh, Gaza, Gaza, <laughs> going into, you know, I graze, it's just, it's a meal plan, <laughs> going into Gaza by, by land. Um, why was there a delay? Will that hinder... Or will it help Israel's chances of success? And obviously, there's a difference between the airstrikes and the missiles, but boots on the ground, why the delay? I mean, it takes – so the, uh, there's many. Number one, it takes a long time to, to to gather an army of this size, especially the the way that Israel re- relies on their reserve force, right? Their bankers and everybody stops what they're doing and goes back to their units and forms up and gets all the tanks and all the bulldozers and everything in position – um, it isn't like they just planned this in the last two weeks either. That they've had plans for decades for the possibility of this operation. And then, like you said, Israel started asking for evacuations. You can't demand evacuations on October 7th, right? especially in the Hamas strongholds, which is, just, yeah. if you look at, like you said, Jabala is in that northeastern sector of Gaza where IDF said from day one, this is where the majority of the combat is. Please evacuate from these areas. Yeah. And 800,000 supposedly have. But that's another reason why you like the right thing to do. Not mm-hmm. even the legal requirement, right? Like the U.S. doesn't call a building before we strike it in any wars that I've ever been in. Um, and, yeah. and, and that ability to attack a city, the right thing to do is 
provide time for all non-combatants, although Hamas doesn't wear a uniform, to get out of the cities. So that's the reason. But you know, it's also about putting in all the U.S. capabilities. You know, Israel, this is not new to Israel having to go to war after being attacked, right? It was attacked by five nations during the Six-Day War and the Yom Kippur War. But it's always had to stand alone. And I, and as a, a U.S. citizen, I was really proud of when the U.S. said Israel's had to stand alone before, but they'll never have to stand alone again. Right. So getting those U.S. ships, as the people think, like the the, the, mm. the carrier strike groups into the area to be able to stop somebody like Iran or Syria or some from getting involved, um, that takes time. Well, that's an important distinction because, look, I have said not one American soldier's life lost for the war between Israel and uh, and Hamas um, is my p- point of view. But I think that morally they need to be supported in defending themselves. That's very different, however, from, hey, look, let them ha- let them duke it out, Iran. We've got our eye on you, right? Flicking that jet. That's different because Iran is a threat to American national security. Would you would you agree with that assessment that that is a reasonable view for people to have? We do not get involved ourselves directly with Israel Hamas, but certainly uh, we have to have our eye on Iran and you know place Hezbollah. When we're talking about Lebanon, we're talking about Yemen. A lot of people who could jump in. That's right, and and defensively, that that also means that we can knock rockets out of the sky that are heading to, to Israel civilian sites. Right. And uh, what did you have? Um, did you have another question there, Josh? Because again, yeah. I'm, I don't know. Because you've been in the actual. Yeah. You know, I'm just. We're all here. We're all, I'm you know pussy boys. <laughs> what the guy with a pussy boy? Yeah. Well, I didn't want to go into. You know, I never wanted to join the military largely because you Me know neither. small hands. Uh, but uh, you know, <laughs> the Canadian military a little bit different. I didn't want to be. You know, I didn't want to be in a Cessna 182 with a shotgun. That's oh, why I didn't yeah. want to join the Air Force, you know. So if I was in the States, I might have been a little bolder. Canadians, the Nazis of Kandahar. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but yeah, what would what is – so these soldiers, these, these IDF soldiers going into Gaza, what, what, what does it look like for them? Uh, what, what kind of obstacles will they face, and how quickly do you think they can uh, accomplish their objectives going into an urban warfare? Uh, and if I could add to that, I think for a layman. Right. Because a lot of people will say, hey, you know what? When people talk about the Second Amendment, the Taliban, right? These guys out there who are just basically using monkey bars and old AKs, they were able to hold off in many ways the strongest military that's ever existed, right? The American military. A big part of that was just home court advantage. Yeah. How big of a role does that play here? Because in the home, the home court advantage is these urban areas that are used in people as human shields. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a there's a kind of a, a bell's curve of scum on the earth, and some use human shields, some don't. Hamas uses um, and builds all of its infrastructure for the sole purpose of restricting what IDF soldiers can do um, in accordance with the law of war, because that a professional military with values, ethics follows the law of war, in, in despite the two sided conversation. So what does this look for the IDF? Is that you know, of course Hamas has, tr- has prepared for decades. For this likelihood, right? So they, but very asymmetrically. They're not. They're not dumb like the Iraqi military who tried to stand toe to toe with the U.S. military. Mm-hmm. They're going to try to fight asymmetrically, like hide in holes, hide in tunnels, um, pop up from hard buildings, and use snipers and use IEDs that, that are very familiar to U.S. soldiers, um, and try to trip the IDF forces or pull them into the urban area where there's a lot of advantages from being able to pick which. Whole, which window you shoot from and, and surprise the IDF that has to move forward. Now, then the IDF side, that it looks like a very slow, um, deliberate clearing operation. But the IDF uniquely are, again, are, are designed for this, right? The IDF isn't like the U.S. military that has to be prepared to fight globally against our enemies. They, they're fighting home. They're literally, like, they can see their house from where they're fighting. Right. Uh, and they prepared, they have unique bulldozers that we don't have that are two stories tall that can be remote controlled that will Whoa. go forward into the urban area, take the shot from the terrace, and then, okay, now I know where you are. I can eat, drop the building if I want or, or engage it in, in, with a tank round. Bit of a yeah. movement to contact so, type of thing. It is, it is, it really is. Um, and this is why it's unique too. This is something that the IDF hasn't really done in, in a very long time. Like even the past operations into Gaza, I mean, they used to occupy Gaza, right? They used to... 2005, um, they left. That's right. And in 2008, they went back in Operation Cast Lead. 2014, they went back, but they were very limited operations. Yeah. Like, they didn't try to punch to the middle of Gaza City. This will be hell. I mean, look up, uh, I mean, 10, 20-story buildings where the enemy could be launching anything down on top of you. 
Um, this is the the ideal, and I, I know you were talking about before. Is the ideal if this is a this can be some type of sur- sur- surgical operation? Like, yeah. no. In the history of urban warfare, it will look like it was carbon bombed, even when it wasn't. It'll mm-hmm. look like raised earth. It will look like hell on earth. It, is that there, is, is there any, or to what extent, I guess, uh, could civilian casualties, I guess, be avoided? The way you're describing it, is it a lost cause, or are there things that that can be done? Can I add to that question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Please do. Uh, and also, yeah, to, to add to that question, do you think it'd be it's going to be less casualties or less uh, destructive than bombing? Right. So I actually, this is the paradox where I tell people, if you want to cause less destruction in urban areas, you need a bulldozer and a tank. Because if not, if you don't have those, if you don't go into an urban area and you try to bomb it, one, there's, there's never been in history that that achieves this level of mission. You don't. You can't even convince the enemy to give up by just straight bombing. Uh, and, and Hamas terrorists is willing to die and actually sacrifice all of their the Palestinian civilians in Gaza for their cause, which is the destruction of Israel and all Jewish people. How do you, so is it a lost cause? No. Uh, again, there are legal requirements that must be taken by the IDF, like asking civilians to leave, like identifying only military targets. You can't shoot at a hospital, a mosque, anything like that, unless it's being used for military purposes. So this is the thing that people want to over you know, kind of gloss over in the media is that the IDF have done beyond requirements to get civilians out of the way, right? And that's why amazingly in Jabalo, after that strike, there's hundreds of military aged males standing around the crater. Like, what are you doing there? Like that yeah. that that is just where you've been asked to leave for your own safety, for the safety of your families if they're still there. Right. So IDF actually does other things that we don't do. Again, calling buildings before they strike them, like calling everybody and sending everybody in the building a text to include the enemy. We're about to hit this building. You have an hour to get out. Uh, they'll, they'll, there's all kinds of things the IDF do to limit collateral, civilian casualties. So they have pretty extensive but rules of engagement then. They do too, yeah. Positive, positive, positive identification of the enemy. I mean, it kind of... But this is the thing that there's been in the 2017 Battle of Mosul, and again, it was against ISIS, so I guess the media didn't care as much. There was 10,000 civilian casualties in the Battle of Mosul, which was Iraqi security forces backed by U.S. military air power. Yeah. Well, I want to continue this, but we're going a little bit over time here. Can uh, w- I'd like to continue on, on, on Mug Club here in a moment for uh, those because we can take their chat as well. Where's the best play, uh, place for people to find you, John Spencer? I know your, your book, Understanding Urban Warfare, is available everywhere. Is there anywhere else people can go? And- yeah, johnspenceronline.com. I, I'm trying to throw all my stuff onto that website. Okay. John Spencer or, or on Twitter, online.com. This is fascinating for me, and I want to... Uh, I want to hear more between uh, you know you and Josh. By the way, thank you uh, all for your service. We appreciate it. And if you are watching right now, and we do have an open invitation to any Hamas representative, pro-Palestinian Hamas representative on this show to present their side of the issues. It's not going to be a Pierce Morgan situation uh, where we would like to... Uh, keep people accountable, and members of the IDF. I'd love to have a split screen with all of you. This conversation is important. Of course, you know where I line up. I don't lie about my biases. If you're on Rumble, click this button, join Mug Club, because none of this happens without you. Uh, We're going to continue with John Spencer. Thank you, Rumble. YouTube, piss off.